Hello and good evening, everyone. Happy second week of Advent. I am Dana Corsello, the Vicar of Washington National Cathedral. And on behalf of the congregation's created creation care ministry, I welcome you. We're going to go ahead and start. Um, I know many of you are still probably logging on. We had we have 100 over 140 registered for tonight. So, but I think that it's important to honor Dr. Harris's time. So I wanna go ahead and begin. Um, let me just say for those of you who were joining for the first time, thank you. And for those of you who were here last week, um, I'm grateful that you were back tonight to discuss this very important topic of creation and crisis. For the next three weeks, you will hear meditations on the remaining three elements of earth, water, and air. It certainly is not traditional to offer reflections on the environment during Advent, but I think entirely appropriate. If the essence of Advent is expectancy, it is also readiness for action. By meditating on the theology of creation care and by connecting ourselves to the elements of nature, we can learn, advocate, and bring about spiritual awakenings. Only then will we be telling the real story of how the whole creation has been groaning and labor pains. That from Romans 8, 22, as a human induced climate crisis envelops and consumes our planet home. So tonight I am thrilled to be able to introduce to you our second speaker of the series, Dr. Melanie Harris. Our own canon theologian, Kelly Brown Douglas recommended Dr. Harris saying that Dr. Harris was doing this work long before it was fashionable. <laughs> she, said, um, she said she was also truly one of the nicest people that she knows. And so that of course <clears throat> was really high on my list. Professor Harris is director of food, health and ecological well-being and professor of black feminist and womanist theologies jointly appointed with African-American studies in the School of Wake Forest Divinity at Wake Forest University. Formerly Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion with Adran College at Texas Christian University, her leadership, teaching, research and scholarship focused on the areas of religious social ethics, environmental justice, womanist ethics, in African American religion. Dr. Harris is also the author of Eco Womanism, African American Women and Earth Honoring Faiths, and another book, many, she's authored many things, but let me just say the other book is Gifts of Virtue Alice Walker and Womanist Ethics. She's a co editor of the volume Faith, Feminism, and Scholarship The Next Generation. She's published widely in the field of leadership ethics, access in higher education, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and eco-womanism, a fresh and emerging discourse in ecology and religion. Dr. Harris is currently writing two books, Engaging Black Interface Faith, Contemplative Thought Activism, and Climate Justice, and the Proto-Womanist Activism of Harriet Tubman and Fannie Lou Hamer. Dr. Harris has offered leadership on numerous boards, including the Board of Directors of the American Academy of Religion and co-facilitates teaching and pedagogy work workshops with the Weibosch Center for Teaching and Learning in Theology and Religion incorporated with the Lilly Foundation. So she is quite an expert in her field and we are thrilled that she is with us tonight. She will offer her reflection on the element of water. And I just have to say that this series really, she was the, she, it was really her idea. We had this conversation way back because I wanted to actually get her physically to the cathedral. And she's the one who said, hey, how about we do this series on the four elements? So I need to give you credit for that, Dr. Harris. So afterwards, the two of us will have a conversation regarding her meditation. And then Janae will share your questions from the chat. We will end around eight o'clock. And then of course, pray Compline together as we did last week. So that is certainly enough from me. Dr. Harris, please, I turn this over to you. 
Thank you so much, Vicar Crisello. I'm so grateful for the invitation, so deeply grateful to Janae and all of those who are working so wonderfully with the Washington National Cathedral. It is indeed an honor to be with you. I am so excited to be able to celebrate this season of Advent with you and am really deeply grateful to be able to <clears throat> commune with you as we move into the gift of peace in this week of Advent through the voice of water. Won't you be in a centered place with me? I invite you wherever you are to come to a settled place in your own self and full being. For many of us that invites us into deep breathing. So as you feel ready and as you feel able, I invite you to take a deep breath in, breathing in the peace of God and exhaling. We'll take two more deep breaths allowing our centeredness and our mind, body, and spirit to come into full union. Breathing in very deeply and exhaling. Take a moment just to notice. And with one third breath, breathing in very deeply and exhaling as you're ready. I invite you to commune with me in spirit, in song, and in word. Mm -hmm. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the ability to breathe in and out, in and out. The recognition of life, Ashe, in us, each one anew in this moment. God, we thank you for we have never seen this moment before. For this day and for this week of Advent, we give you thanks for the gift of uncovering hope in our lives. And in this week, to recognize that each day you grant us peace. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts, fill our minds with compassion, deep wisdom, and understanding. Fill our lives indeed, O oh God, with your presence, even in this night. It is in your names we pray. Amen. Our beautiful meditation today begins indeed with breath and song and ritual. And it also begins with the beginning, a word from Genesis. Genesis chapter 16, verses 7 through 13, and Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. 
The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring of water in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road of Shur. She gave the name to the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. In Genesis 21. When the water in the skin was gone, she, Hagar, put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby about a bow shot away, for she thought, please, I cannot bear to watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she wept bitter tears, water falling from her eyes. God heard the boy's cries, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles your heart, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy's cries. Lift the boy up, steady yourselves, steady your hand and go, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water in the wilderness that they might drink and live. Water in the wilderness. The gift of water is life in any season. And in this season of Advent 2022, we are reminded by the story of Hagar that water is not only life, but it is also hope, that first gift of Advent, and also peace. On the second week of Advent, we lift up these two elements this evening, the gift of water, as told through the sacred womanist story of Hagar and the gift of peace. I named the story of Hagar as a womanist story because Hagar, according to pioneering womanist theologian, Dr. Dolores S. Williams of Union Theological Seminary in New York City, she reminds us that Hagar is the first woman and the first person in the Bible who names God, the God who sees me. Dr. Williams' classic book, Sisters in the Wilderness, not only opens our eyes to perspectives in the Bible through the lens of African and African-American women, but it also argues that Black theology, absent of Black women's voices, is void of spirit, void of love, void of light. It is not enough to have the passion for racial justice woven into the realities of hearts and minds of Black theologians, even as great as James Cone and Deotis Roberts and William R. Jones and so many others. No, for womanist and for Williams, it is crucial not to overlook Hagar's story and to recognize her relationship to God, her naming of God, and her transformation through water. Water, one of the most sacred and increasingly scarce elements of earth, two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen, this element of earth literally defines the gift on this planet. Without water, there is no life on earth, not for humans, not for beings, not for many species, not for many plants. Water is key to transformation. And as we see in Hagar's story, it is essentially the link leading one from despair to hope, from death to life. Listen again to the scripture. Genesis 16, verse 7 and 11. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring of water in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road of Shur. She gave the name to the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Genesis 21, 19. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water in the wilderness that they might drink and live. 
In that same way that water brought peace to Hagar, we also recognize that there was a powerful spirit working within Hagar to be able to open her eyes to providing a strategy of survival. That gift of God we can see today, that strategy, having a wisdom and understanding of knowing how to make it step by step, even if the way isn't always clear, is peace of mind. As we consider the celebration of the 50th year of the Clean Water Act celebrated this past October, we recognize that as climate activists and as believers, there is something miraculous about belonging to a wide global network of justice workers, of justice keepers, who work and keep working to insist that environmental justice and access to clean water is a right for all. That water, clean drinking water, is a human right. It is a right to all beings on the planet. But we know that this right to the life-giving power of water doesn't happen without a fight. It doesn't happen without sincere, dedicated workers, some in the kingdom, some beyond. We know that there will be many other theological narratives out there suggesting that water only matters to some and is only allowed for those who can afford it. Hagar in our story was one who could not afford much, perhaps not even the water that was provided for her. And it is for this reason, from an eco-womanist perspective, that she cherished water and considered it sacred. Eco-womanism is a perspective in environmental justice and environmental ethics that highlights the sacred understanding wisdoms of women of African descent. It suggests that there is something unique about the voices of people of color, particularly in light of their connection with the earth not just for the past and history making, but for really thinking through climate change and strategies for survival in the midst. Having these strategies, hearing these voices is peace of mind. It is the water that cools the mind. It brings us peace. This Advent, we receive water as a gift, but also through an eco-womanist reading of this passage on Hagar, a challenge to be peace, to give peace, to fight for fair access, equal access to clean water. How might we be the living word in our time? How might we be the hands and feet of God in this moment? Is it not to provide peace, water to those living in Mississippi with the reality of not only water shortage, but facing real water crises? What is going on there is not just a combination of environmental racism, but also a history of economic injustice faced by too many communities of color across the South. Water, peace. Peace I leave with you, Christ speaks in the New Testament account in John 14 and 27. May peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. So let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This teaching of Christ, heard differently through an eco-womanist lens, encourages us to uphold a truth of environmental justice, that water is sacred that water is divine, and that we are significantly water.
The water in the passage that we see in the spring is also important and that it is connected to the same water that flows from the eyes of Hagar and her son. This connection between water in nature and water coming out of living beings is important to pay attention to because it suggests that water is not just an earth justice or environmental justice issue, but that it is a social justice issue. That just like water, we too are divine. That these lives, that all black lives matter. Water, peace. This peace I leave with you. Even the water of tears, the water of difficulty, even when we are grieving in moments of despair, even this water is sacred. It is sacred and ought to be held in deep grace. In the season of Advent, it is not uncommon to be annoyed with waiting, waiting on the promise of God, waiting for the right healing to happen, waiting for reparations and reconciliation to happen in a number of different kinds of relationships and waiting for the end of another year. The unsettling that can occur in our hearts in this time of waiting is held by a deeper reality. It is held by the reality of peace. Imagine now your greatest struggle, your greatest challenge, the one thing you find yourself praying about the most. Lift that challenge up now in your heart and envision that challenge being surrounded fully in a beautiful ocean of water and peace. The truth is, no darkness lasts forever. The truth is, you are being held in an ocean of love and grace. The truth is that peace is all around even the deepest and darkest trouble. The African-American spiritual wade in the water suggests that there is something of courage and something of God, even in the troubling of life, even in the troubling of the water. May we listen now for the complex reality that peace sustains even in the midst. Wade in the water, wade in the water, children, wade in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Wade in the water. Wade in the water, children. Wade. God's gonna trouble 
Water, peace, my peace I leave with you. The transformation of the holy is provided for Hagar by the awesome love of God. And for whatever reason, in the passage, Hagar has difficulty seeing that the water is all around her. May we, in wisdom tonight, this second week of Advent, recognize that water, peace, is available to even us. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> thanks be to God. Thanks, truly, thanks be to God. Um, simply stunning and beautiful. Oh, you're singing. I didn't expect that. And I'm, <laughs> you're amazing. Um, Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, what I loved about your meditation is it was so powerful because I'm trying to take notes, as I said to you before, so we could have some sort of intelligent conversation. And I just wanted to listen mm -hmm. and just, and, and be present um, because you, you framed it in such a beautiful way with Hagar. I, I also didn't expect that. And, and it just turned everything around for me. So I have so many questions and, and friends, please put your thoughts or comments, questions in the chat and Janae will get them to me. Um, first of all, I wrote it down as fast as I could, but in your, could you please define eco woman, eco womanism for, for us, so that we could actually explain it to someone else? Because I think that's really crucial to everything um, that you presented tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation, even mm -hmm. to have a conversation as well. I appreciate the affirmations. I do find mm -hmm. that particularly in Advent season, that it is such a sacred gift to be able to share a song and music as a way of being able to commune in the spirit. And as you said, to deepen into a deeper level of presence. Um, many times this season, particularly for clergy people such as ourselves and many who work in churches, it's a very busy time. And oftentimes we are sometimes the last people to be able to experience that moment of peace as we're moving through the season. Sometimes communing through song is a really, really good way to do that. Um, you will remember that at the beginning of our time this evening, we really began with breath 
and really stopping to slow oneself down. This gift comes to us from many different religious traditions, um, but particularly in Christian mysticism in terms of really recognizing that we cannot move in spirit without spirit being fully in line or aligned mm -hmm. um, in our body, mind, and spirit. I am also really encouraged by breath meditation by the Buddhist tradition and how important that is. And so that interfaith kind of connection for me is a reminder um, that both breath and song have a way of lifting the heart, especially mm -hmm. and slowing us down, right. which is so crucial, so crucial. This kind of contemplative approach to environmental ethics is a deep part of eco-womanism. Eco-womanism is an approach to environmental ethics and particularly environmental justice that highlights mm -hmm the voices of women of African descent, mm -hmm. and particularly African-American women. The work itself, the scholarship, the theory, the practice really does pull out the contributions of women of color, but particularly African-American women to the environmental justice movement and to strategies that have created spaces for communities of color to have more agency and voice, but for the entire movement to be able to move forward so that we think about the work of a woman like Harriet Tubman, we think about the work of Dorothy Height, we think of the work of Alice Walker. These are all powerful Black women, kind of womanist women who began their own life and their own lives of faith and activism deeply connected with nature and deeply connected with the earth. To mm -hmm. ignore that mm -hmm. is to silence Black women. And in the words of Dolores Williams, who I quote tonight, yeah. um, and certainly lift up, she recently transitioned just a few weeks ago, a oh. powerful womanist coming out of New York and Union Theological Seminary. But it was her voice and this riff on Paul Tillich that reminded us that to silence a Black woman is a sin, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sin of defilement. Mm -hmm. And that the only way to be able to recognize that sin and to repair the harm that is done when we silence Black women is to really be in full repentance. And that mm -hmm. silencing of Black women is not uncommon, um, unfortunately, and is mm -hmm. also very familiar to the earth and the silencing of the earth, the voice of the earth. So it's one mm -hmm. of the reasons why I'm so excited that this advent with Washington National Cathedral really giving voice mm -hmm. to the earth, mm -hmm. voice to water, voice to earth, uh, voice to air, voice to energy and fire. Um, mm -hmm. This is a really important aspect of eco-womanism, which is deeply grounded both in kind of Christian mysticism, but also African indigenous religious tradition and right. also contemplative practices and a variety of different religious, religious paths. Okay. Oh, that's helpful. Um, thank you for that. Now, could you say more? So as you were offering your meditation, because <clears throat> when we think about water as it relates to the climate crisis. There's never enough of the water, like it out in the West, there's a drought, it's being rationed. And then if you look at the coast, especially the East Coast with the water rising and the ice caps melting, there's too much water. And then we get to Flint, Michigan and down in Mississippi where the water is dirty or poisoned or just out of negligence for, like you said, environmental racism. I mean, there, because as you were talking, my mind was just going, water has so many connotations. Mm -hmm. It is life. We are made out of water. And then you kept talking about the peace and the awesomeness of God's love for Hagar and the, the tears, her healing life was coming out of her eyes and then I went right to baptism because when you were singing weight in the water we often sing that in the Episcopal tradition um, as we prepare for baptisms during this service so that's a lot there but can you speak to just I, tying that all together I mean I, am I making any sense <laughs> This is such a yes, it is. A, it is, a, I think, a gift of being um, 
able to sit with water, right? And to hear the voice of water. Water is very fluid. And so of course it shows up in many different ways, not just in terms of environmental justice issues and trying to protect water, but then also recognizing that the lack of access to water is indeed because of economic injustice, because of racism, because of the base of white supremacy in this country. Mm -hmm. um, those are real hindrances to the free flow of water. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, in many religious traditions, especially in Christianity, there water is a sacred mm -hmm. element to many of our rituals, including yeah. baptism. Um, I'm remembering the, the gift of, you know, being baptized as a young Black child, recognizing that the water was the one thing you did not want to touch your hair, because as an African-American child, your hair would be in a completely different state if your if <laughs> water touched your hair. Um, but that is one of those elements of religious life that one can lean most fully into as well. And doing so leaves you completely transformed, completely mm -hmm. changed. And so the accepting of the full self, one's full hair, uh, wet as it may be, um, but and also the accepting of the full self in the way that God sees you that it's not just about the physicality, but it is about your spirit. Mm -hmm. This too is a gift of the voice of water. So I go back to Dolores Williams. She has this extraordinary term called multivocal. And womanist thought is multivocal in that it has sings a number of different truths at the same time. So there are a number of different concepts that are kind of interwoven in the same sense that we might talk about or think about intersectionality that you can never just talk about race, you can never just talk about gender, you can never just talk about class, you can never just talk about sexuality. You have to actually talk about all of these particular parts mm -hmm. of one's radical subjectivity. In that same sense, we have to develop ways of thinking about justice and honoring the variety or fluid ways that water is heard and yeah. moves in order to move and to flow in, in what I think true justice asks us and calls us into right now. So the folks who are suffering in Mississippi, um, one in Flint as well, but especially now, I, I, I don't even know how that's even possible that they don't have clean water so some of those folks are my folks and my family originated in Mississippi. Um, and it, it is possible. It's difficult to live um, that way, but it is possible. But how did that happen? I mean, mm -hmm. don't the white folks there have drink the same water? Mm -hmm. how, do you know, I'm talking about the yeah. environmental racism. I, it is just... And how do you, how would you give comfort to them? That That's the thing that upsets me so much because mm -hmm. we just take it for granted mm -hmm. and they're still suffering. There is a lot, um, there are a lot of invitations, I think, particularly in Advent for all of us to become more conscious in just the way that you're saying. Um, some of us are still waking up to the reality of the water crisis in Mississippi. Some of us are still waking up to the reality that Flint, Michigan isn't quite healed. Right. Um, and I think Advent really is a time for us to hear earth, to hear water in this case, so as to we might become more conscious, literally learning about the history of race in Mississippi mm -hmm. and how it is that there are so many systems that seem completely dysfunctional and have been dysfunctional for a really long time. And how it is that several generations of people and families have lived there for such a long time under such circumstances. Um, I often find that in, um, in prayer and in consciousness, that when we come into the reality of oneness, that we recognize that it's not just them down there struggling or suffering, but that we are them, right? And that they are us. Mm -hmm. um, that, and I think that's the true voice of water, right? That water is everywhere and water is everything. So if you contaminate water, as we're seeing, if you contaminate earth, as we're seeing in Ukraine, then yes, that is going to have an impact on New York City. And that is going to have an impact all over the world. 
Um, and I think water is one of those elements that teaches us that to stop, to be conscious, to learn more, right? To become more aware, but then also to recognize that the water in our own neighborhoods and in our own cities are not all that clean either. Mm. Um, to try to find out which of the neighborhoods, even in our own cities, which of the schools don't actually have the cleanest drinking water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not to assume that it doesn't happen in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> no, that, that's a really good point. Well, I did see a question in the chat. Um, how can we help communities of color? Um, say, for instance, Mississippi is obviously the obvious one with issues like their water contamination. What can we do? write our senators, right? And how can we advocate? I mean, I know Bishop Barber, you know, part of the Poor People's Campaign, a flank of that campaign, of course, is environmental racism. And we certainly support him, but how can we advocate better? What, what should we be doing? Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question. I think what comes to me in this moment <clears throat> is really taking the beautiful challenge of tonight, um, and this, you know, being together, this communing uh, seriously in terms of either making a, a direct donation, not just within one's own denomination, but also local churches, churches on the ground who are literally doing what they can to create mm -hmm. spaces enough for people to be able to click, pick up water. So in many spaces, of course, in Mississippi, it is still the case that people are actually buying water every week. Mm -hmm. be able to move through the daily life, uh, brushing the teeth, making sure that the cooking water. So that's an expense. Mm -hmm. And if one does not have a really, really um, healthy paycheck, that's an expense right. that's been added to. So recognizing that some of what we, we might consider um, kind of $5 or $10 mm -hmm. that may be extra change, those dollars actually really could make a difference in a lot of families' lives. So trying to mm -hmm. find the denominational connections, but also the local church connections um, in Mississippi and throughout Jackson, of course, that are really uh, ready to receive and to make sure that that water gets down um, to the right places. I think the other the other real kind of advocacy is to do a little bit more digging, as you said, in terms of research in our own states, but also addressing and writing our senators to help them recognize that this is an important issue to us. Mm -hmm. um, there are multi, there are a lot of prongs to the environmental justice movement, and there are a lot of ways to be an activist and a lot of ways to be an advocate. I will also say that in some of our journeys, we may not have the resources to be able to donate in that way. Mm -hmm. We are faith keepers and we are mm -hmm. celebrating Advent, that there is a way in which we might ritualize water differently, even in our own lives and even among our own congregations. Mm. So there are lots of different stories um, in African-American life, but also in a lot of different religious lives about the gift of being able to give a preacher or a prophet a cup of water or a mm -hmm. glass of water after they have served or after they have ministered. What might it mean this Advent to mm -hmm. take that seriously, not just for those who are serving in ministry, but way beyond that, those who have mm -hmm. been on the front lines in COVID, those who are actually working as first responders for the flu and RSV, those who are in children's hospitals now in many cities, which are being overwhelmed, right, with the mm -hmm. reality of all of these different. So what does it mean to bring a cup of water to those mm -hmm. who have been working so deeply? So it's mm -hmm. a different a different voice of water, um, but I mm -hmm. think it definitely ignites our own passion for and our own uh, desire to be justice keepers, true justice keepers in the everyday. Mm -hmm. So did everyone hear that? We could be justice keepers. I love that term. I've never thought of it that way. We could be justice keepers by offering someone a cup of water. And that has many different meanings. Um, wow. You kept saying sacred. Water is sacred. I, we know that, but we don't often think that when we flush the toilet, when we brush our teeth. 
you know what I mean? It's just, so thank you for reframing the theological meaning of water. Um, because now with the climate crisis, like I said earlier, you've just reframed my whole, everything about what I'm thinking now, because I just think we have too much of it. We have too little of it. It's not clean, you know? So thank you for bringing it back to truly the source, which is God mm -hmm. and our tears, those, the gift of our, of our tears. I, I'm going to stop talking now because I want to, <laughs> Just have, I wait. Let me just ask this before I forget. What is your faith tradition? I am ordained in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The AME. Okay. Uh, yes. Wonderful. Yes. Okay. But you don't use the reverend in your title or in your I bio. Do, I, I do sometimes. I do sometimes. I appreciate that. One of the gifts I think of being both a preacher and a scholar is to be able to be fluid as water. Um, and so oftentimes um, people know a lot of the work of eco-womanism is indeed informed by that, uh, that part of my life and ministry. Um, but it's good to be able to bring that out. I appreciate you asking the question. Oh, of course. Oh my goodness. Of course. Um, so any, it's seven fifty one. friends. Were there any pressing thoughts or comments or questions um, for Dr. Harris? I'm just going to take a quick look, Janae. Um, I'm looking we, through that the chat and it looks like there are a number of different questions. Um, I'm looking at one about, um, ah, it's a question about kind of different variety of different environmental perspectives with even within uh, the body of Christ. And so the question mm -hmm. is something like, how do you convince um, particular Christians such as fundamentalists um, that the preoccupation with racism, white supremacy, and the suffering of people of color um, is isn't being racist. Ah, okay. So I think I think if I'm understanding the question um, correctly, it's a question about how do we weave in kind of social justice issues into environmental justice issues. And I mentioned this just a little bit in in the meditation. It is eco-womanist perspective that the, that earth justice is social justice and social justice is, um, is earth justice. And so there are a lot of different perspectives, even within the body of Christ, that suggest that um, it is not important to actually look at racial injustice or economic injustice, that those kind of issues will just always be with us. Oftentimes what we find is those particular logics are webbed to a particular kind of disorienting frame or form of Christianity. That is to say that to ignore the reality of white supremacy and the impact of racial violence in our country and still claim to be Christ-like actually isn't being, in my opinion, a good and faithful Christian mm -hmm. in that we're actually ignoring the true work, the justice commitments that Jesus, Jesus self actually embodied. And so there is something very central about black liberation theology, very central to womanist theology to place Christ at the center of any justice work that we do, recognizing that justice, Jesus was a justice keeper that there were lots of ways in which he stepped out to speak against sexism. There were lots of ways in which he stepped out to speak against patriarchy. There were lots of ways in which he himself was a model of dismantling logics of domination that were kind of impacting um, the, religious, the religious leaders of the day. To be able to follow the model of Christ in that sense is also a part of the call of Christ. And so to be a justice keeper in the way that Jesus calls us to is also a way to flourish as a Christian, to be mm -hmm. deeply embedded as a Christian. Mm. Wow. Wow. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> you need to come back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. 
Thanks for the invitation. It's wonderful to be with everyone. I'm so grateful for these wonderful questions and such a wonderful audience and, and such a beautiful congregation. It is a gift. I think Maya Angelou, you know, was one who always said, thinking people need to think. And mm. it is a time where we do need to be thinking about our theology. We need to be not just living out the theology of the past, mm -hmm. but we need to be thinking and bringing our full minds to the work of living out theology. James Cohn was known as a wonderful professor of mine in so many, and mm -hmm. that he would often remind us of the scripture that you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with your mind. Don't leave your mind on the sideline. Um, if there are ways in, the, in that we need to be thinking through different frameworks for doing justice, and particularly environmental justice, that that's God's work too, to be able to bring environmental justice to, um, to this particular time that we're in, in mm -hmm. even the Anthropocene. So recognizing that too is God's work within us. Can you um, leave us with just a word of hope, like, especially for our planet home, we, you know, um, cause I know someone will email me about this call to action, <laughs> but <laughs> more than that, how do we stay hopeful? Hmm. I think you, I you talked about it a little bit in your reflection. Yeah, I think Advent is a time in which we are invited to wait and certainly be still. And in light of all that's happening, all the forms of violence that are happening um, in our own personal lives, but then also around the globe, it is often hard to wait and be still and seemingly not do anything. I think the understanding of faith is actually that waiting doesn't necessarily isn't a passive thing that waiting is really deepening your own communion with God so that you can hear mm -hmm. the spirit clearly. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of us, that means doing something radical in terms of slowing down and really creating space in our life to watch snow fall, mm -hmm. to not get stressed in traffic jams on Christmas, to not wait to the last minute to be able to share Christmas greetings and seasons with blessings with everyone. For many of us, the slowing down is a way to hope. And mm -hmm. I will be honest, particularly because Eco Woman is, is deeply committed to mental health. Many of us are afraid to slow down because the grief of the world is so deep. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. difficult to grieve the reality of white supremacy mm -hmm. and its historical frame in the United States of America. It is very challenging. Mm -hmm. It is difficult to grieve all of the lives that we have lost through COVID. It is difficult to grieve that. And yet in order to be community, in order to live in and with earth, we too must grieve mm -hmm. in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a part of living a life of faith. And so living a life of faith is not just waiting, but it is also waiting with anticipation, but with action. If one is not yet certain of the peace that we spoke about tonight, living in one's own heart, then this is a challenge to slow down so that you can hear more than a call to action to do something, but a call to action to be. Mm -hmm. Amen. That, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and that being, I think, is important. It's not a passive excuse, to, you know, to just do yoga five days a week between now and December 25th. Um, that being is to be real about the racism that may be embedded in our own minds mm -hmm. and to really do the work of getting that out. That being is to be real about the heterosexism, the transphobia that may be circulating on our own news feeds that we're not even recognizing because we're not, as Hagar was not able to, we were not seeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So being still enough to be able to see and to see God indeed, but to see 
Mm -hmm. Even if that seeing means grieving. Mm, beautiful. Well, you've opened us up. I, I really think you've broken us open. I, I know for myself, but I would bet for everyone else who's still on this call, you have just broken us wide open. Mm -hmm. And for that, we are all eternally grateful. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Harris, thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, I wanna honor your time and everyone else's. Friends, I hope you will be back next week. Um, <clears throat> Next week, we have Dr. Norman Wurzba. Wurzba. Um, he is a, at Duke Divinity School, and he will be talking with us about Earth, the element of uh, Earth, and so the ground and all, all of that. And so I'm, we're excited about that, and I hope you will tune in for that next week. Um, but why don't we uh, go ahead and pray Compline? Janae, if you can put that up for us. And Dr. Harris, be ready. I may need you to, at the very end, if you could sing a benediction. Mm. Can you sing us out? That's a beautiful invitation. Okay. Yes. Okay. So everyone take a deep breath. Let's center ourselves. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault and thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, forgive us all of our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Psalms 31. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let us never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe, for you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me, for you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And will you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Be our light in the darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy, defend us 
from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are weary by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend to the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous. And all for your love's sake. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping that awake. We may watch with Christ and sleep, we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For those eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see a light to enliven the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord, Thanks be to God, the almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen. And if do you mind singing us out? Sure. Let the church say amen. Let the church say Let the church say amen, amen, Good night, my friends. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you all. May you have a beautiful sleep and wake rested. Good night.